you know, they call out each player by their number order. You go around the circle, the lights on you. And they got to me and I was skating and I was every butterfly was going in my stomach. I was it like all hit me at once. It, it almost felt like. And then I was so nervous. My first shift just went horrible. It was it was just so many nerves, but that's when it really kicked in. I always think it's like funny that it like hit me right there. It was like, wow, this is crazy. Like, First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times bestselling author of 41 books an NFL first round pick with an eight year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Adam Fox, in just your second season in the NHL with the New York Rangers, you won the Norris Trophy, given to the best defenseman in hockey. The first to win it before their third season since hockey legend Bobby Orr. Welcome to our podcast, Adam. You already know you're welcome in our home since you married our youngest daughter this summer. Yeah, thank you. Avid listener. Uh, so happy to finally uh, grace my presence on the podcast. We couldn't have you on until you said I do. Then, then yeah, you Exactly. Got the <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's start back when you were a kid. You grew up in Jericho, a town in the western part of Long Island, not far from New York City. What did your parents do? And tell us about your relationship growing up with your brother, Andrew. Yeah, so uh, like you said, I grew up in Jericho. My dad and grandpa had a, a garment business, uh, sold garment. And my mom was more of a stay-at-home mom, was uh, the one who took me and my brother Andrew to school. My dad was the, the hockey dad, though. He did everything hockey. My mom was everything school. So they had a nice little balance of it. And yeah, Andrew's uh, three years older than me, so I kind of did everything he did. I guess in hockey, you don't really, you know, you stick to your, your age group, but, uh, we played for the same organizations and, uh, youth hockey and, uh, schools. And, uh, so we were always kind of, kind of together in that, but, uh, him being three years older, you don't really play together, uh, in travel hockey as much, but, uh, at our house, we had this little, tile roller hockey rink in our basement so a lot of uh a lot of battles a lot of fights that did not make my uh my dad too happy at times but uh it was a nice setup and yeah it was nice to have him in terms of you know sports and school and uh just have someone there around to you know like a like a brother to to, to do everything with when did you start playing hockey and when did you first spend time on skates i don't even remember starting playing. My dad says like two, three. Uh, I've actually talked to Troy about getting his kids set up with uh, <laughs> with hockey, but uh, yeah, I don't even remember. I it's it's funny because I always say how frustrating it seems to learn how to skate, and luckily I was so young I don't remember not being able to. So it's always kind of just been something I felt I've known how to do. But uh, like I said, that rink my dad had set up in the basement that was probably there from when I was two years old and onwards so I feel like I've always probably had a stick in my hand some rollerblades on and uh yeah my dad was a, a big ranger fan so hockey was uh definitely the sport he wanted to get me into what about organized hockey when did you th when did you first play like on a team yeah so I mean again to my knowledge I played on this team the Long Island Gulls from six years old till I was 14 and uh kind of played with the same group I know played on some it's like double a triple a and uh so when I was like four or five some with double a but again nothing's too competitive at that you're not really traveling and then yeah, sure. 
uh, from six, six years old on, it was the Long Island Gulls and we were traveling everywhere, Canada, I mean, 5 a.m. to New Jersey. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, if you ask my dad, he'll, he'll let you know he, he woke up and took me there and he'll, he'll let you know that he was doing it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think from, from six on, that's when it was really the organized and, uh, the Long Island Gulls was pretty much the team from, from then on out. Your father was a powerful influence on you from taking you to watch the Rangers at Madison Square Garden growing up to giving you tips when you were watching hockey on TV. How does your father know so much about hockey? Yeah, uh, he'll tell you he's the smartest person when it comes to hockey, but uh, he actually does know the game very, very well. And uh, we always kind of have uh, the arguments because one of my strengths is you know, hockey IQ and ability to, to see things on the ice. So we always say, how much credit does he get for that? And, and, uh, how much is just natural. But, uh, I think part of it is, you know, just naturally on the ice, you feel things, but a lot of it is him just from a young age of, uh, you know, even something as simple as in hockey, rimming the puck up to a winger. He always wanted me to, to try and make a play, especially at a younger age. And, uh, I think that philosophy of always trying to make a play uh, just kind of stuck with me. And uh, obviously, as you get older, it's it's not as easy. And sometimes you have to take that that simple, you know, rim the puck that he didn't want me to do when I was younger. But uh, yeah, his 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 brain for the game. And, you know, he didn't play it at any necessarily high level at all. But uh, just watching and, and understanding, he definitely gave me some some tips when I was younger that allowed me to to grow and, and understand a little more of being on the ice and uh, just being aware when I have the puck and, and things like that. So he definitely played a, a huge factor in, you know, who I am as a hockey player and uh, obviously my love for hockey. Is there anything that when you were younger, he said to you that had kind of like an oh, aha moment? I don't know if there was an aha moment. I'm trying to think if, again, I just remember like for him, it was always try and make a play. He, just even at six, seven years old, did not like kids with their head down who wasn't passing the puck. I was always, I mean, even today, I'm not much of a, a goal scorer, but even back then I was always a passer. I was never the one trying to trying to really score. I always was trying to pass. And I think that's kind of an influence of his, of just having your head up and hockey's, you know, really the ultimate team sport of uh, you can't really do it yourself. So uh, I've always been, you know, getting teammates involved. And I think he's always had, had that influence. And yeah, I think other than that, I mean, I don't know if there was ever a ha aha moment. I think there was a lot of moments where I was nervous for what he'd say after a game in terms of <laughs> uh, calling me lazy or something when I was 10 years old. But uh, <laughs> no, in terms of just making plays, I think that was the one thing that he, you know, always stressed to me. We've had quite a few professional athletes on the podcast, and one common denominator has been that everyone has dreamed of being a professional athlete as a kid, but not you. What were you dreaming about when you were growing up, Adam? Um, yeah, I mean, hockey was always a passion, but I honestly yeah, can't say I thought ever about the NHL. I Maybe I guess didn't think about the future that much. I know my my parents just wanted to kind of use hockey as a as a way to get into a better college. And I remember having a conversation with my dad when I was 11, 12 years old. And he was saying, you know, if, if he could even get into Amherst, which is a D three hockey team, he's like, that's a win. Like he could do that. And, uh, you know, being from long Island, it's, it hockey's grown a little more, but you weren't really seeing it as, Oh, I'm going to make it to the NHL. Everyone or a lot of people from long Island have made it to the NHL. So, uh, I think for me, it was just trying to leverage it into getting into a better college. And I think once I hit 13, 14, then you start to, to realize, okay, the kids I'm playing with, the kids I'm just as good as or playing D1 schools, you know, being said they're going to play in the NHL. So I think that's when play becoming a, a pro hockey player hit for me. But when I was younger, it was just, you know, playing hockey for fun. And I think you always want to play in the NHL. I don't think it was ever something I thought could be real, but uh, I think just trying to get into the best school was kind of that, that pathway where initially hockey was. 
If you didn't play in the NHL, what would you have wanted to do? Or I guess at the time, what did you want to do? Yeah, I don't know. I think, uh, again, I, I... You're still a little young. Yeah, never really. Even even like when I was in high school, I never really thought like, okay, what is hockey? What if hockey doesn't work out? I don't know if I was naive or just in the present and not really thinking about, about the future, even as a freshman in college. I mean, granted, I was drafted to the NHL, but you don't know if hockey's going to work out. So I never really thought if hockey didn't work out. Uh, I know I've always been interested in finance. My brother does finance. A lot of my friends from school and and home or in, in the finance world. So I'm sure that's something I would have gravitated towards, but, uh, luckily, luckily hockey did work out because, uh, those people in finance also like to tell me about how hard their job is too. So, uh, I'm happy I didn't have to think of something outside of hockey. Did you have any other interests as a kid? You mentioned your dad converted your basement into a rink of sorts. So I'm guessing you spent most of your time down there, but any other hobbies? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my interests, honestly, when I was younger, it's, it's boring. I, I, outside of sports, I really didn't really dabble in, in much. Uh, but it was everything from soccer, lacrosse, hockey, baseball, uh, just kind of did everything in that sense. And yeah, even down there, I mean, we'd have friends come over, we played dodgeball down there, turn the lights off so you couldn't see the balls coming at you as a kid. Uh, so we just like to have fun that down there, I think, uh, you know, the number one thing, my dad is pretty old school in terms of, uh, you know, not being on your phone and, and getting out. And he'd always give the classic, when I was your age, we'd be at the park, just pick up games and, and stuff like that. So I think for him, his most important thing for me was, was just to be active and, and be having fun with friends. And uh, so I think most of my interests just lied in doing that. And uh, whatever sport, whatever game I could be getting into, it was mostly what I was going to be doing. Can you talk about your relationship with Charlie McAvoy, the star defenseman for the Boston Bruins? It started when you were just kids, right? As a side note, I spoke to him at your and Tate's wedding. What a lovely guy. After the Rangers, of course, now my second team to root for has to be the Boston Bruins because of him. Yeah, Charlie's great. Charlie, uh, it's funny. I was going through on my phone. These old photos popped up and there was one of me and Charlie from eight years old with these medals around our neck and uh you know we talked at that wedding too and just it's kind of special you don't really you're not really able to you know maintain a lot of friendships from six years old on and uh yeah like we mentioned earlier with those Long Island Gulls teams he was a guy that was on those teams through and through with me and uh you know hockey could bring people together but also for us we've you know he's in Boston I'm in New York so you don't necessarily see each other every day and uh you know I went to his wedding last year he came to to mine and you know just to have that friendship and uh maintain it has been has been awesome and my dad still talks to his dad his sister actually is a uh one of our strength coaches with the Rangers too so uh keep up with his family a fair bit and uh yeah he's he's the sweetest guy I mean just you talk to anyone and there's not many people who are gonna have a if any a bad word to say about him so uh, he, he could play kind of mean on the ice sometimes and use his, his body, but off the ice, he's, uh, he's great. And yeah, I mean, I, I know he spoke to you guys at the wedding and, uh, you know, he's just, like I said, the nicest guy and to have that friendship over, over the years has been just great. For people that, that don't know or don't follow hockey as closely, um, he's, you and him are typically up and I don't know if, you know, I know you're, you're very humble, but you and him are typically up for, you know, being one of the best defensemen of the year every year. And you guys, so you played together. Were you from the same town or just, just near each other? No, just near like 15 minutes. Like he was, uh, Long Beach. I was Jericho, but we'd, you know, do the, do the sleepovers, play, play NHL on Xbox. And it was funny too, because I, uh, my mom brought over some, uh, like just old accolades and, and things from, from college and, uh, to, uh, our house here. And, one of them was a, a plaque of uh, NCAA All American. They hockey. They broke it up in East and West, and the two D on the the East side was me and Charlie. So uh, I just thought that was kind of cool. And I mean, yeah, growing up, you know, like I said earlier, Long Island, it wasn't really a hockey hotbed to to have uh, two defensemen who are you know All American together, and then like you said, being uh, 
you know, even up for an award like the Norris, uh, together. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I, I'd bet money he's gonna, he's gonna win with that eventually. And, uh, but yeah, to, to, to have both of us from, you know, just Long Island, same age, be, you know, be able to do that together is, is pretty special. So you were just a kid when you go off to live with a new family in Michigan, or was it Minnesota? Anyway, you go off to play on some development team and to finish high school. Tell us about that. How does it work? And your mom couldn't have been happy having you leave the house. Yeah, it was, uh, it was Michigan. It was Ann Arbor. Uh, yeah, trying to describe it to people outside of hockey is, is always tough because, you know, you guys, football guys, you stay at your high school or at least local and uh, that's how you get recruited. And, but for hockey, it's almost like you have to go play for what's called the junior team. And a lot of them are based in the Midwest. And this one is the U S national development program. So you go, they have a U 17 and you're there for two years, U 17, U 18. So yeah, you, we went out there, uh, at 16, lived with a billet family. And, uh, that's where I met a lot of, uh, a lot of my best friends today. I mean, guys who I just went on a golf trip with. We do eight of us, all eight are from that team. And uh, yeah, it was a great time for me. I mean, a lot of those junior teams, you go at 16, 17, and most of the team is out of high school and, uh, you know, 19, 20. So for all of us to be the same age and uh, kind of be going through the same school, same hockey, same experiences, it it definitely helped a lot. And uh, yeah, some of the Billet families there, I mean, they're just – the nicest people too. I mean, me and, uh, Ryan Lingren, we got pretty close and his belt family was just the sweetest family to us and treated us so well. It took us to Cedar point, which is a roller coaster park one, one weekend. And, uh, it was so generous and we see them, they've come to New York for the playoff games. And, uh, we've seen them in Detroit when we've gone out there. Um, but you know, my dad always was like, saying, oh, when you're 18, you're out of the house, you're out of the house. And then when I was out of the house at 16 and my brother was in college, I get calls every day. So I think he uh, he spoke it a little too soon. He got bored when, when both of us were out of the house. So uh, it was good. Obviously, moving away from home that young is, is tough, but it definitely makes you grow up a little quicker too. How does that whole process work, though? Do you get recruited to go do that, or do you have to make a decision as a family that you're going to try it or what? Yeah. So there's, uh, there's a thing it's called like 40 camp. It's like 40 kids who they see as the top U S born for that age group. And some kids already had gone to Canada junior leagues and commit to that. So some don't go there. Um, also some maybe think, Oh, I'm better off being a first line guy on this junior team than a third line guy on this team. So there's different factors that play into it, but for the most part, yeah, it's uh, a 40 man camp tryout, they call it. And, uh, you go there and, uh, play against all these other kids. They break you up into teams and, uh, I think it's a couple of days and then they offer you a spot. And yeah, for me, it was, you know, I, it was an easy decision for me. I think, I think, uh, you know, my family advisor at the time was, you know, now my agent and my, my dad maybe, you know, thought it was, you know, a, not as easy a decision just in terms of when you're there as a defenseman, there's eight defensemen. And uh, like I said, you could maybe not be the, the top guy and you could go to a team in, in another uh, same junior league, but it's called the USHL, go to a team there and maybe be the, the top guy and, and develop a little more. But, uh, you know, I was couldn't be more happy making that decision. Obviously, when, when things work out, it's easier to say, but uh, just being there and, and making the friendships and uh, obviously having hockey work out too, it, it ended up, you know, perfectly. So, uh, but yeah, that, that whole process is, uh, a little stressful in the moment just cause it, it's such a, a major decision at that point. Still even talking about it. It's so crazy. Like thinking about leaving at 16 years old to go live with another family for yeah, hockey. Yeah. Yeah. When you explain it to hockey people, it's like, or non-hockey people, it's, it makes no sense. Would you be comfortable doing it with your own kids one day? Yeah, because it's natural in there. It's very, uh, like organized. Like we had 10 p.m. curfew, like 9 p.m. during the weekday. So it's pretty, pretty rigid there. Is that what Charlie did too? Or did he stay in Long Island? So he went there too. Um, but Charlie, so the funny thing for me and Charlie and again, me and, me and Tate always 
bicker about this because in hockey, if you're born any time and like for me, I'm born in 1998. So if you're born any time in 1997, regardless of two months or eight months, you're considered a year older. So Charlie's a December 97 and I'm February 98. So in the hockey sense, he's a year older than me, even though it's two months. So he was the year before me. So he went out there uh, while I was still on Long Island. Uh, so we were there at the same times because the U17 and U18 teams go to school together at the rank, different teams and different schedules, but uh, you see each other all the time. So he was there when I was there. And, uh, a lot of other guys that, uh, you know, like Michael Fletchran, who was, you know, one of the guys who gave the speech at my wedding and everything. So he was there, ended up going to Harvard and uh, other guys too. But uh, yeah, Charlie was there, but he went out a year earlier than me. So after your time in Michigan, you ultimately chose to go to Harvard. What was recruiting like? Did you visit other schools besides Harvard? Was it a tough decision for you and your family? Yeah, so I visited uh, two schools. Yale was the first one. Um, it ended up I had we had to this so hockey. There's this bunch of like summer showcases people go to, and uh, went to one. I think freshman year, going into freshman year, and uh, ended up Yale said come visit. I had gone to a Harvard thing, and uh, you know Ted Donato was like, "We like you, but you're young. We'll see." Uh, so I went Yale, visited there going into my freshman year and this, they changed it now, but at that time you could verbal commit <laughs> as a seventh grader, if, if you wanted to, it was kind of meaningless, I guess at the time, cause they just said, all right, you're committed. Uh, so it's going into my freshman year, visited Yale and, uh, we didn't think they were going to offer us. I thought it was just, uh, right, here, this is, we like you visit at the end of it. They, you know, offered us, uh, you know, scholarship there. And, uh, my parents, we were stunned, but he, the coach even said, uh, credit to him. Like, I don't need an answer now. He wasn't pressuring us. He was like, take some time to think. Uh, so then obviously Harvard was the other school that, you know, was the only other one that I would be interested in. It was once Yale and Harvard offered, it was, like I said earlier, education was the main thing at that point. I still didn't know hockey was going to do anything. So, uh, yeah, Harvard ended up offering, uh, you know, a little after that. And, uh, I wouldn't say it was easy between the two, but I knew some, some people who were committed to Harvard being in Boston seemed a little more my flavor. And, uh, you know, they had the bean pot too. So it was kind of all that coming together, but I mean, academically I couldn't, couldn't go wrong, but, uh, those were the only two schools that I even got offers from and even, you know, considered. Adam, you're uh, obviously a very good professional athlete, so I can say this without hurting your feelings. You're not a physically imposing guy. So when you're in eighth grade, I mean, you're getting Division One schools, which obviously the Ivies for hockey is like, I, I think it's like the SEC for football. I mean, where are, are you just always in the right place at the right time on the ice at that at that age? Or like what, what does a coach see – like you obviously had, were recruited and got invited to the, top, the 40 camp and to go out to, to Ann Arbor. So you're obviously, you know, doing very well. But I, I imagine for you growing up, there were kids that were bigger than you that maybe they put ahead of you and you had to kind of work, outwork them or, or kind of take the spot. Is that is that the case or were you always yeah. kind of at the top? Yeah, I, I mean, so growing up, like I said, I always thought the game really well. But I mean, um was never the fastest. And even back then I was <laughs> slow. So it was really using my brain out there, but, uh, you know, I'll give credit. My dad got me. He always says he wished he's got me with her sooner, but, uh, the skating coach on long Island, Jackie Monzel, she was great for me, super helpful. Uh, you know, got me to, you know, an efficient skater in terms of, I've always had, you know, good edge work in terms of, lateral and everything like that but in terms of straight line speed she she helped me take it to to another level for me and yeah like like hockey it's it's funny because a lot of other sports like even with like the combine like nhl combine like you're not really you're taking it a bit but you're not reading into it like a guy's 40 40 yard dash in a an F, nfl combine or anything like that so you could kind of see the development in terms of 
how someone thinks the game. And that was how I think I got viewed. But yeah, I was never, never the biggest guy. And I think, you know, even for me, I guess people still probably see it as an anomaly of not the fastest skater because usually smaller people are, you know, faster skaters on the ice or they do, you know, have, you know, this strength to them. And for me, I've never had that, you know, always tried to improve on it, but never was the fastest guy on the ice or the strongest or, you know, hit the hardest. But I think just being able to, to think the game and has always helped me, you know, stay above a uh, step above. And I've since 14, have always gotten like the, the classic, uh, you could do that now, but it won't work at the next level. So I think that's always, uh, you know, been a little bit of a motivator for me. And uh, like you said, a little bit of a hindrance too, in terms of how people at that next level might have viewed me. But, uh, you know, credit to the coaches I've had, because even at Harvard, you know, Ted Donato did not, you know, see it like that. He loved the skill and, and you know, did not see it as any, you know, weakness or, or anything like that. So, uh, but yeah, I think definitely growing up, you got the the classic that won't work at the next level or, uh, yeah. not strong enough or fast enough. It seems like like in, in football sense, they would definitely put the bigger kid in. And I don't know anything about hockey in general, but especially compared to you. But it seems I would imagine like when you went to Michigan, there was a big kind of strong, hard hitting defenseman that they probably put in that you had to compete with that. I don't know. It's, it's I guess it's it's hard to compare. Cause yeah, it's it's, place I'd now. say in hockey, it's more of like for me, I had to like offensively I don't think anyone ever doubted things I could do it was always defensively because of the things like you said if you see someone who's 6'4 230 you're gonna think he could defend pretty well as opposed to someone who's 5'11 and a buck 80 so I think for me at those levels when I first got to you know Ann Arbor and I had to prove okay he can play defense he does care about that going to college and then even when you sign in the NHL it's still a concern and uh, it's always, can he defend at the next level? Can he do that? So I think for me, it's always been, I've always thought the offense will take care of itself. So just proving that defensive side has always been my focus when I've got to that, that next level. It's a concern until you win the Norris trophy, then they stop. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little validation. You have to have some good grades to get into Harvard. What was your favorite course? <laughs> favorite course. Oof. Probably math. I think uh, if I have to pick one, can I pick gym? Is that is that <laughs> pickable? But no, I think uh, like I said from the start, my parents' education was always like the number one priority for me and my brother. And uh, I think in terms of school, I think some of that stuff came a little naturally. But they always, you know, pushed me to to study and. Uh, my dad was definitely trying to get me to read way more than I do. I know I've gone back and forth with Tate about my, my reading prowess and <laughs> having to, to pick that up a little. But uh, I think math was always something that was, was fun for me. I think, I mean, as you get older, math gets a little more, a little more tricky. But, uh, you know, at the younger ages, it was always fun to try and do uh, quick math. And, you know, even growing up, they give you those quick multiplication tests where you got to fill it all out in a minute and, uh, I think that kind of just plays into me. I'm big on crosswords and riddles and stuff like that. So I think uh, trying to do those quick math things was always always fun for me and uh, always kind of kept my brain sharp. So uh, if I have to pick one, I'll say I'll say math. At what point did you realize that the odds were stacked against you, given your size and speed, or did you not even think that way? Uh, I don't know if I ever, you know, realized it was stacked against me. I think it was more uh people s saying like oh like i said that won't work at the next level but when you're 5 to 11 years old you're not really like oh i'm too small or at least for me i wasn't maybe hockey's a little different but like i said i was always able to to think the game well so you hit that age where some kids are maybe hitting puberty before others and you're like, oh my God, these kids are like, you start hitting at like 12. You're like, I'm terrified out here. Um, <laughs> but overall, I don't know if I ever really doubted that I, I could do it again. Maybe it was just me being naive and, and uh, a little stubborn, but uh, you know, I always thought things would work at, you know, the higher level. And 
I think maybe that, you know, stubbornness helped me out and in terms of just confidence. And I think a lot of people maybe, you know, get to a level and have a coach that tells them, you know, to try and become something different. And luckily I never had that, you know, coaches, you know, encouraged me to, to play the way I was playing. And, uh, you know, sometimes it, it was a little different and, uh, I tried to make plays that were a little different, but, uh, yeah, I don't know if I ever really doubted myself because of size or, or speed or anything like that. You can tell we're football guys that every question for yeah. the last five minutes has been yeah. about how you You're so short and scrawny. How'd you do this? <laughs> if you weren't really a really good player, I wouldn't ask you. By the way, I was an undersized defensive end in the NFL. Undersized takes on a different meaning in professional sports. Your coach at Harvard, Ted Donato, believed in you despite your size and speed. In fact, you credit the coaches at Harvard with your development as an undersized defenseman and just embracing it. Yeah, undersized for you is 6'4", 260 <laughs> for me is 5'11", 180. And I say 5'11", a little generously, but... Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Ted Donato was, he was great. Like I said, coaches, when you get to a certain level could always try and, you know, change your game. And, uh, you know, there's other coaches in college that you go there and they're trying to play a, a trap system or something that doesn't really let out your skill. And, uh, you know, credit to him. I think that's a huge reason there's been so many NHL guys to come out of Harvard in the last 10 years is, he takes players for, for what they are and uh, lets them shine in that sense, whether they're skilled or, or defensive defensemen or, you know, a four checking, you know, forward or whatever their, their thing is. He doesn't try and put people in this, uh, you know, this box or in this way of, you know, it's his way or the highway. He uh, just lets people, you know, allow their skill to take over. So uh, he definitely, he definitely helped me and, uh, you know, all the coaches there. So especially in college, you're, you know, we played, I played 90 something total games in three years, which I think I played more games my, you know, second year in the NHL. So, uh, it's definitely different. You're practicing a lot more. So they have, you know, a bit of more hands on in terms of, you know, your development in that sense too. So, uh, yeah, they were great. I mean, he's, he's great too. Everyone, everyone, uh, you know, loves Teddy and, He's, uh, you know, a great guy as a person, too, away from being a coach. Going through all of your awards and records at Harvard could fill the entire podcast. Could you tell us the top three that are the most memorable? Ah, uh, okay. I mean, the hockey side of me is going to come out a little in the sense of my freshman year when we won the bean pot and made the Frozen Four was the most fun. So that was more, like that year I made the like uh, that was the all American thing with me and Charlie. So that was fun, but I just feel like it was a lot more fun in the sense of Harvard hadn't won a bean pot in 27 years and, and we were able to do that. But, uh, I think my junior year was, uh, really when I was, you know, being my best as a player and, uh, was up for the Hobie Baker, ended up losing to Cal McCarr, who, ended up being a pretty good player himself. So uh, I think things like that are, are cool. And, uh, you know, we've been up against each other in the Norris. So I think going up against him and that was, was kind of cool and kind of something in the sense of it wasn't any, like it would have been a cool thing to win, but it's nothing that I, I lose sleep over. Uh, but it's cool to say, you know, going against him and a Norris trophy and going against him as a Hobie Baker and, uh, you know, he's going to go down as one of the best defensemen ever. So uh, being able to compete against him for a Hobie was, uh, you know, pretty cool. I know you wanted me to say uh, my all academic team award, but <laughs> sadly it was not that. Meanwhile, during college, the Calgary Flames trade you to the Carolina Hurricanes. Tell us how your agent orchestrated a trade for you to ultimately end up on the New York Rangers, the team that you grew up rooting for with your dad, in the garden. Yeah. So again, hockey in terms of, you know, I know we try and relate it to football. It's so different. You get drafted as a, you don't declare, you don't do anything. You're just 
part of an age group that's eligible. So after my 18 year at NTDP was drafted by Calgary and it's honestly like, it's a special moment to be drafted, but it's also, you know, not like it's a little less of a, a meaningful thing than obviously football where you get, you know, a signing bonus based on where you're drafted. And, uh, you know, just it helps a lot more in that sense in terms of hockey. You're For a lot of people, you're still going to college or going to a different team first. So I didn't really, uh, you know, think too much after just went to college and uh you know tried to play well and, and enjoy it there and yeah then after two years there was you know they kind of wanted me to sign and uh you know I didn't think I was ready after my sophomore year so you know thought go back to school it was again a pretty easy decision and then they traded me to to Carolina and uh then after my junior year definitely felt ready and uh you know in, in hockey you a lot of it is opportunity and anything, anything is opportunity. And, uh, you know, Carolina at the time of signing at a pretty, pretty good decor. And, uh, you know, I think there's only so many times in, in life where you're able to control what you're able to do, especially in, in sports. And, uh, you know, was able to, you know, use some of my leverage in, in, in college and, uh, you know, had the ability to, to play for a team that's close to home and, and grew up rooting for. And, uh, not only that, they were also, you know, in a rebuild where it was younger guys were getting a big opportunity. And uh, I thought that was perfect situation for me, you know, not only being close to home and like, like I said, growing up for them, but, you know, being able to grow with a lot of young players and, uh, you know, I'm happy that it did work out after, but uh, yeah, I think for me, when you have that opportunity to control a little bit of, of what you're able to do as an athlete, it's uh you know, rare. So I thought it was too good to, to take that opportunity and uh, use that leverage. So you get draft. So your rights get drafted, but you don't get, you're not on the team. You don't get paid unless they sign you and then they can trade your, so your rights getting traded from Calgary to Carolina, you had nothing to do with it. just happened. Yeah. So yeah, that was more of me going back to school. So the reason for the trading of rights is after four years, Let's say I stayed in college four years, you become a free agent. So Got that's it. like kind of the thing a lot of players have, have done. So, uh, you know, it's a CBA, right? It's in the, the, uh, the agreement. But uh, mm-hmm. so that's kind of where it's like they have your rights and, uh, you know, could use that uh, in terms of you could use that as your leverage or, or uh, negotiating a way to get traded or not signed somewhere. <laughs> I know you get a lot of flack online about the, the Carolina from Carolina fans about leaving to the Rangers. But I mean, it sounds like, again, I didn't, you and I have never talked about this before. It sounds like it was just a better opportunity for you. It's almost complimentary to Carolina. They had such a good squad at the time. It was better for you, you know, personally to be in New York. It wasn't a slight at Carolina at all. Yeah, of course. I mean, and you get it like as like a player, like fans, like, they're supposed to not like me. Like, obviously, <laughs> they're not gonna not gonna like that. But it's again, it's also a compliment because if I flamed out and was in the minors and not doing anything, Carolina fans couldn't couldn't care less about trading me. They'd probably be yeah. happy with the return they got. So, uh, you know, I think for me, obviously, I get both both teams fans not being being happy. But again, I try to you know you try and go about things the right way and you know, try and let them know. And, uh, you know, again, I have nothing but good things to say about both those organizations. Went to development camps there. They treated me, you know, very well. But again, there's only so many times you could put yourself in the best chance for a, a good sure. opportunity. So, uh, yeah, I figured to take advantage of that. Every, every single person, angry fan or not, if they were in the same situation, would put themselves wherever they thought they would personally be, you know, yeah, best, up, best set up. What was that like putting on the Rangers sweater and skating out onto the ice that first time? It must have been a dream come true. Yeah, it was crazy. It's funny. I say, so when I signed training camp preseason, didn't get like nervous at all. Didn't like, I thought it was cool putting on the jersey, but didn't have like any butterflies or anything like that. And then made the team opening night. 
And for the home opener, they do, you come out of, I guess what you call the, where the Zamboni comes from. And, you know, they call out each player by their number order. You go around the circle, the lights on you. And they got to me and I was skating and I was, every butterfly was going in my stomach. I was, it like all hit me at once. It, it almost felt like, and then I was so nervous. My first shift just went horrible. It was it was just so many nerves, but that's when it really kicked in. I always think it's like funny that it like hit me right there. It was like, wow, this is crazy. Like coming out and, uh, you know, in front of 20,000 where I was once in the crowd there. So, uh, that's when it was really the, the surreal moment hit me. Let's go back to your time at Harvard university. When you and I first met, I knew it was serious because Tate never had us go to dinner with a guy ever. What were your first impressions? Yeah, I mean, I thought you guys were great. I was nervous. I'd never met a girl's family before or her parents. So, uh, yeah, it was it was fun. I was nervous on my best behavior, trying to just say as least as possible. And uh, yeah, I was it was fun. I think uh, I think Yank was there too. So I think he kind of loosened up the mood a little bit. I could be wrong about that, but I think he was. So it was good. Plus, I knew, I knew, uh, I knew Troy and Thane were the ones I had to, you know, really get to like me. So, uh, who was there? Was was Ty there? I don't think. I think it was us five. Maybe, maybe one other person. I just think it was uh, your mom, your dad, Yank, and uh, me and Tate. There could have been. I, oh, was Ty there? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I was so I don't know if you time. were there, Tim. But we went for sushi another time. Me, your mom, Tate, and Ty, and I don't think your I don't think your dad was there for that one. He must have been there for lacrosse or something. And I don't know if Ty said a word. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I need this thirteen year old kid to like me, <laughs> and it's not easy to get a thirteen year old to like you. But I think I uh, got in his good graces now. One of the things I loved is that you left Harvard early without graduating to play for the Rangers, but you ended up going back in the summer to get your degree. What motivated you to do that? Yeah, so I kind of knew after my sophomore year that I could be leaving after my junior year. So I added one more class to each to the end of that sophomore year and then my junior year, the fall and spring semesters. So when I left, I only had five classes left and it actually worked out. I mean, perfectly for me, obviously not perfectly in the sense of everything, but COVID allowed Harvard to do online classes. So they normally would never offer that. And you'd have to go there for seven weeks and, uh, you know, go into the lectures and, and everything like that. So I was able to do two years in the summer, three classes, one summer to another and, uh, was able to, to finish up, you know, pretty soon after. So it was good for me. It didn't like allow it to linger. And, you know, you're at this point, maybe you're getting older. You don't want to spend uh, seven weeks in Boston when you're 30 to finish up two more classes. So it was, it was perfect for me that I was able to get it out pretty quickly while that, while that knowledge was uh, a little more fresh in my mind. What was it like playing during COVID with the empty arenas? It was weird. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it was more weird for other people. I mean, when some of the, the teams we played in college and even ourselves sometimes at Harvard would not have, you know, 10,000 people, we'd have two, two, 3,000 maybe. So uh, it was weird at first. I think you don't really understand the value of fans until they're not there. Um so I think it was definitely awkward at first, especially that bubble when we jumped right into that playoffs and there's no one there. And yeah, they tried to pump in crowd noise and it's just, it's not the same. I think you really understand the value of fans again, once they're not there, but uh, you adjusted to it and it was good, but of course not the same uh, adrenaline rush as 20,000 people there. Did it feel like a scrimmage almost? At first, I mean, jumping back into the, the bubble playoff was, was weird. But then after that, I think as that other COVID year kept going, I think then it started to. But 
uh, it was just like when you skated out, it was, uh, yeah, weird is the only way to, I think I can describe it. I don't have a, a better word, but it was, uh, you got used to it at first. It felt a little bit like an exhibition, but then you just realized a six, three, two, ten guys coming in on the four check on you. So <laughs> you're not really thinking exhibition anymore. Your first two seasons with the Rangers, I watched every single game on TV. It seemed like every single game you were getting noticeably better. Did it feel that way to you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there's just things you you learn and uh, tendencies that work, things that don't, and just confidence. I think when you start out, you're you're just naturally going to be more tentative of uh, not wanting to make a mistake and, and keeping things simple. And, uh, you know, as you get that trust from coaches, like we talked about earlier, someone like me, I've always had to earn that trust from coaches as a, as a defenseman. I didn't start out penalty killing in the NHL and was able to earn enough trust to get a shot and, uh, did well enough where, you know, could be used on the penalty kill. So, uh, I think things like that, you just get more confidence and get more comfortable each, each day. And, uh, once you get that trust too, I think it allows you to, to play more free, which, uh, you know, for me is allowing me to, you know, play the best hockey I could play. Your timing was perfect because you then extended on a big contract with the Rangers for seven more seasons. Only then with the stability and closeness to home, would I allow you to marry my daughter? Ha, you know that I'm kidding. I loved you from our first dinner together at legal seafood in Cambridge. And so did Tate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Probably helped Tate make the decision easier to marry me, but uh, <laughs> no, it was, yeah, I mean, loved you guys too from the start, throw it out there at legal. It was a great dinner. Uh, but yeah, I think the after that second year, you know, you're able to sign a contract in hockey a year before. I don't know if it's, if other sports are, are similar like that, but uh, you know, you start the negotiations and, you know, at a certain point it's, crazy because you let the agent do most of it but they start throwing numbers at you that you never imagined being being thrown at you but uh you know there is still a an aspect of of negotiating and i think for me it was you know i didn't want to be you know too greedy or or anything like that and a bunch of defensemen had signed deals at, at that time charlie being one of them so there was a general range that that we knew we'd we'd fall into and uh, going long term was always the the goal. I don't think it was ever a, a thought to to do something short. So uh, being able to sign that it was it was awesome. Yeah, I still remember like you know I was trying to keep my parents in the loop, but not too in the loop because, like I said, when you throw some of those numbers around, it's hard for them to not just you know say to you, "What are you doing? What are you doing? Take it, take it." Um, <laughs> so I think I was trying to keep them, and then. Uh, we were in Vancouver when I eventually signed it, and me and Tate always have a, I don't know anymore, but when we'd all when we'd have something that would be big accomplishment or whatnot, we were always in different places. So of course I was in one of the furthest places in Vancouver when I when I signed that contract. So uh, yeah, it was awesome. Got to you know tell my parents, and uh, you know once that pen hit the paper, it was definitely a sigh of relief. Did you know you were going to stay? I mean, you wanted to stay with the Rangers being uh, the team chemistry and being a fan of that and close to home. Would you, did you ever even think about testing for agency? No. So, yeah, this is I gotta, me explaining the hockey a little bit. So until you're like 27, you're a restricted free agent. So okay. it's not like I could end that contract and go somewhere else. It would have to be like, you know, really couldn't come or to terms or anything, but it was more, you could do a, what's called a bridge deal, like a two or three year contract. And uh, that gets you closer to that UF, UFA where you then could Got sign it. anywhere. Um, so for me, it wasn't about, Oh, I'm not going to be here. It was, I want to be here long term, and, yeah. you know, signing that two, three year deal could set you up for better for that next one. But it wasn't anything where I, thought I didn't want to be here long-term. So uh, no, nothing ever in terms of a short-term deal. That one was for the Rangers. Yeah. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have dumbed down the hockey as much. 
I think I think it's good because I don't. I mean, yeah. I don't know our average listener, but I don't know anything about. I mean, I yeah. I know the only thing I know from hockey is the video game, and then what you and I have talked about, which is not that much. Yeah, you know the top guys in 2016. <laughs> yeah, 2016. I'm lights out. Lalongo is in the net. Yeah. You got to say Lundqvist. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Lundqvist, we couldn't get, we couldn't draft him in the first. We'd had to draft. I'm trying to remember who we played. Oh, uh, Stamkos is who we drafted yeah. in the first. Who would have been at that time? Steve Nash or somebody? Steve Na- Rick Nash. Rick Nash. Steve Nash is a WWE wrestler. No, Steve Nash is the basketball player. He's also a WWE oh, wrestler. Really? Oh, yeah. Steve Nash, the, the point guard. Yeah, maybe that's what I was thinking. I know I mentioned this at the Open, but I wanted to hear more about it. In just your second year in the NHL, you win the Norris Trophy given to the best defensive player in the league. The only other player to win this before their third season is the legendary Bobby Orr. How did you feel when they called your name? Yeah, it was uh, crazy. I was having a – so – it was after my first year, COVID hits, come back, it's that COVID season, and, you know, it's the shortened season. Came back, just tried to build off a good rookie year, not thinking I'd try and, like, win the Norris Trophy, and I uh, just had a good year, had a really good stretch, like, had a really long point streak that year, and uh, just kind of was playing real confident, and uh yeah. And then by the end, you know, I knew it was a chance. Uh, you know, you hear some things and then, you know, got got a call that I was a finalist. And then, uh, you know, after got a call that I won it. So it was uh, it was surreal. I mean, it was crazy. Even just the names I was up against, Hedman, who, you know, had been up for six straight Norris trophies i think won one and uh makar was the other one who you know like i mentioned earlier is just unbelievable but uh then you hear some of the names who have won it and uh again i think it was one of those things because it was so early it was more of a i don't know shock but more uh like unexpected going in uh but then to win it and you know tell my tell my parents tell my brother it was uh it was special. It was, it was really cool. And then it was the COVID, uh, award. So it was all, all online. So there wasn't like this award show in Vegas or Nashville or anywhere where, wherever they have it. Uh, so I did a, a sit down thing and Brian Leach was the one who, uh, presented it. And Brian Leach for, you know, those who don't know is probably the best Rangers defenseman ever won the, the MVP of the playoffs the year they won the cup won at least one Norris trophy himself and kind of like one of the best U S born defensemen ever. So for him to, you know, present me with, it was, was really cool and uh, invited some, some friends over to watch the awards and kind of acted a little dumb. Like I didn't know I was going to win it, but uh, had a little, little pizza party at at my place and uh, you know, just kind of celebrated like that. It's not like you've slowed down either. Two years ago, you finished in the top three for the Norris again. So you're really establishing yourself as one of the elite players in the NHL. I think that people place too much emphasis on defensive players scoring. Now, you do score often, but very few players get by you. The announcers attribute your defensive skills to your intellect. Is it that, or did you just have phenomenal reaction time or both? Uh, yeah, like you said, I think for me, the offensive side is always, uh, you know, taking care of itself. I've never tried to really cheat for offense in terms of, like you said, looking for those points that, uh, you know, people love to see. I think I've tried to focus a lot defensively and, uh, you know, I think for me, what helps me defensively isn't, you know, physically knocking people over. It's using my stick, using my head to, try and, you know, read plays and anticipate and, uh, you know, jump passes and uh, just have a good stick in terms of, you know, passing lanes or, or jumping on a guy if there's an opportunity. So I think those things are, uh, you know, the things I try and focus on. But, yeah, like you said, once you're, uh, you know, kind of established at a certain level, there's 
certain expectations. And uh, I think for me, I try not to, you know, change the way I play just because there is these expectations of putting up points and uh, doing this and that. I think I've always had the mentality of, you know, points, especially in hockey, will take care of themselves. If you're playing really well, if you're making the right plays, things take care of themselves, especially as a defenseman. You can't control if I make a pass and a guy scores or misses the net or the goalie makes a nice glove save. So uh, I think just trying to do the right things each game and uh, kind of letting that other, you know, point stuff and, and things of that nature take care of itself. If I watched a game when you were younger, you were on defense and you would just be scoring, you would, like what? I'm trying to think what I would see if I was watching you play when you were younger. Um, I think maybe more just like, oh, this guy is like making nice plays and like the other guys can't get the puck from him would be more it, it wouldn't even be can't get the puck like he's skating circles around everyone it would be like oh like that's a really nice pass that's a nice like move I I mean when you're that young it's hard to you know say I think that's maybe more of a, a Bruce question than me yeah but because you're I mean because you're saying like you're like well at 13 or 14 that's when I kind of started to know I was good like 13 14 it's more just like it's not like you're taking the puck all the way and no one's touching you and you're scoring. Um, it's more like you're just making smart, like breakout passes or like you're head faking a guy at the blue line and getting, you, you might make a couple moves that like shake a guy, but uh, for the most part, you're just like creating plays and even defensively, just like not letting much get by you. Got it. I'm so cool. So that, like in football, you'd see a running back, and then you know when they're young, they're like, holy yeah. cow, they cut back the whole field or whatever. Yeah, I guess it would be like maybe like a point guard in basketball would be the best equivalent because he's not like who's just like making the right making the right plays. Reads, making the right, yeah. Yeah. You live a blessed life, my friend. You know that I am obsessed with my Christian faith and that I truly consider what I'm dealing with health-wise suffering from ALS as a blessing. I know that might sound crazy, but I believe that this is a second chance that God has given me to prioritize my life based on the teachings of Jesus Christ, who was Jewish, as I know you are. And I revere what the Bible refers to as God's chosen people. Can you talk about what being Jewish means to you? Yeah, I think I think for me, like being Jewish and, uh, you know, it's important, my family, you know, I'd come from a Jewish family and even just being in New York, being on the Rangers, you get a lot of comments from, uh, you know, that just naturally there's not many Jewish athletes out there. So I think, uh, you understand that you're an influence to kids and, uh, kids look up to you. And, uh, I think for me trying to, you know, just carry myself in that sense, understanding that, uh, you know, being a Jewish athlete, kids are going to, you know, Jewish kids are going to look up to me and, uh, you know, kind of make me a little bit of a, a role model in that sense. So, uh, yeah, I'm proud of proud of being Jewish. I think it's uh, a big part of my background and definitely something I uh, take a lot of pride in. The Rangers had the best record in hockey last season and won the President's Trophy, but you guys lost in the Stanley Cup semifinal to the eventual champion, the Florida Panthers. It's a long, grueling season. Can we expect the Rangers to be contenders again this upcoming season and maybe win it all? And what did your team learn from your run so deep into the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, of course, my answer is yes. Uh, but I think it's when you get to you know that point in, in the season, it's just the margins are, are so little. Like even every game against Florida and Granted, there was games they outplayed us, and uh, but it's still one goal games. Every game besides one game was a. I think there was three straight overtime. Uh, every other game was besides the first game was a one goal game, and even when you see them in the Cup final against uh, Edmonton, it comes down to a game seven, one goal game, and uh, I think you know they always say you got to lose before before you could win and, and things like that. And, you know, no one wants to lose. No one wants to have the team that is 
you know, the best regular season and then, uh, you know, doesn't win the cup, but it's hard. It's, uh, you know, we've obviously the two years prior, I think, I think this year we, you know, we're a little more, you know, ready. I think, you know, that two years ago we made the conference finals against Tampa and, uh, you know, played 20 games in, in 40 days. And uh, I think that's another thing. I think injuries happen and, uh, you need health to be on your side. And there is a little bit of, of luck factors, but at the same time, you, you know, have to take advantage of, of opportunities. So, uh, I think, yeah, it sucks when, when you don't win it all, obviously, but you just got to come back, learn from it and, and stay hungry. I think look at Florida last year, they lost in the cup final, learned some things, you know, learned about winning those tight games, those two, one games that, uh, hold a lead and be able to protect a lead late. And I think those are things that you build on and, uh, gain that confidence going into the next year. Now on to our final word segment, where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? Getting married to Tate. <laughs> <laughs> what is the biggest adversity you faced? Uh, oof. Oof. I've actually been so fortunate not to have, I guess, I mean, recently, I guess just injuries, I think, has been the, the one thing that I've had to overcome recently. What are you most excited about? Now that I'm, I'm married, eventually just having a family. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that uh, I'm definitely looking forward into the future. And uh, for hockey, hopefully, you know, hosting the Stanley Cup one day. The name of our podcast is Nothing Left Unsaid. Do you have anything you want to say? Uh, no, I just want to thank you guys for having me. Obviously, uh, you know, I've gotten very close to you guys and, uh, you know, support everything you're doing with the the podcast and the Tackle ALS, of course, representing <laughs> the shirt. But, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, it's it's been great. You guys have obviously been nothing but nice to me and, uh, you know, just super thankful to be so accepted by your family and, uh, you know, happy to, you know, jump on this podcast or uh, do anything to, you know, obviously help the, the cause whenever. So uh, just thank you guys. Adam, I always try to end every podcast with the same question. One thing that was important to us is to have on a lot of guests from different backgrounds. Uh, we didn't want it to be just sports or just ALS or just writing and all that, all that good stuff. So who are a couple of people you know that you think we should have on the podcast next? Uh, I think Charlie would be a great one. McAvoy, I think he'd be, He'd be great, uh, you know, in that athlete realm of someone who has, uh, you know, a good background and is just overall a good person. I think uh, someone I've gotten to know pretty well recently, I don't know if you may know him, Troy, but Nikki Cass, he's, uh, I met him through doing the, uh, you know, Bagels and Fox thing where I interviewed interviewed some uh, personalities and he was one of them and he's just the man. He's hilarious has such a positive outlook on life i know your dad would love him in that sense and uh he's starting so many different ventures and uh he started with just youtube videos or tiktoks or you know putting stuff on instagram not youtube instagram and and tiktok and just put stuff out there and he's blown up and he's starting different ventures of his own app and uh just started this thing called entrepreneur where he uh is teaching people how he does all his business things. So he's funny. He's probably got great stories to tell. So uh, he would be a great, great guest for you guys. Oh, those are two awesome ones. Adam Fox, it's been such a pleasure spending this time together and hearing you share your story. Both Troy and I are proud to call you family and love you. May God continue to bless you and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for letting me come on the podcast. Love you guys. And uh, hopefully it blows up. We'll do episode two after you guys win the Stanley Cup. We'll do it. We'll hey, bring Matt, it back. Follow up. The first <laughs> recurring guest. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. See you, Adam. Thank you. So, yeah. Thanks, guys. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to barclaydamon.com. 
Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nurse Corps for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.